Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and a happy Women's Pharmacist Day. Yeah. Um, today's programming is sponsored by the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and also by ICHP, BPSA, APHA, SAP, CPMP, CDEC, and SNAPA. There will be a attendance sheet towards the end of programming. Um, I would like to now read the land acknowledgement. The University of Illinois Chicago College of Pharmacy is standing on the traditional territories of the three fire people, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and the Bodiwabi tribes. And at this time, I would like to welcome Dean Schumach. Thank you. Thanks, Tommy. Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today to celebrate Women uh, Pharmacist Day. And a little bit of background on, on this day. It started uh, in 2018. Um, and it was a brainchild of uh, Suzanne uh, Solomon, Susie Solomon, who was um, a, a 2004 graduate of our PharmD program. And Dr. Solomon actually stayed on and worked for us in the Office of Academic Affairs here um, from 2009 to 2014. So we're really proud to have an alum who started Women Pharmacists Day. Um, it's been supported by all the major pharmacy organizations it's part of the month long celebration of National Pharmacist Month, which I'm sure you're seeing posts on social media about and uh, um, different kinds of celebrations for that as well. And the purpose of Women's, Women Pharmacist Day is to highlight the contributions um, of women to the profession of pharmacy and to advocate for women in leadership positions. Uh, as you may or may not know, women make up 75% um, of the pharmacist workforce but um, disproportionately low number of leadership positions in pharmacy are held by women. What, and while this um, is changing through efforts like Women Pharmacists Day, we need to continue to encourage uh, career mentoring of women pharmacists and pharmacy students and to explore ways to increase um, female representation in pharmacy leadership roles um, because diversity in leadership positions makes us all stronger um, and our profession stronger. So today um, we're gonna celebrate Women Pharmacists Day with a fantastic presentation by Dr. Daphne Smith-Marsh. Um, I hope you know um, Dr. Marsh, she's a clinical assistant professor in our college. She practices at the Miles Square Health Center and she specializes in diabetes. She graduated also from our Firm D program in 1997. You might want, not have wanted me to say that. Um, <laughs> Don't worry, I'm older than you. And completed a PGY-1 um, at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Southern Illinois. Daphne's a certified diabetes educator and she's also a certified uh, in advanced diabetes management. She gets invited to speak all over the country uh, and internationally on diabetes and, and related topics. She's well published um, and she teaches in our courses as well as providing patient care. So. Really excited to have Daphne here. Um, and the title of her presentation is A Shining Example of Leadership in Patient Care in Diabetes Management. So Dr. Smith, Marsh, take it away. Thank you so much, Dean Schumach. And thank you to Dr. Clara Alway and the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the invitation today. Um, it is my honor to share my experience uh, as a pharmacist providing diabetes management. So I'm going to take you on part of my pharmacy journey, which actually started here at UIC. I'll review my professional training as well as the leadership roles that I was involved in here. I will tell you a little bit about my ambulatory care practice, but mainly I want to focus on uh, my passion for diabetes, um, diabetes education and management, and review the clinical opportunities uh, ways to be community engaged in the community, as well as discuss rewards and challenges. And lastly, I will leave you with pearls of wisdom. So as Dean Schumach mentioned, I am a graduate of this College of Pharmacy, and I was very active in organizations when I was here. I'm a Kappa Psi brother. I was involved with APHA, ICHP, CPFI, but I really uh, gained leadership experience as an officer in SNAFA. So I was a president one year, vice president and secretary. I was also inducted into Phi Lambda Sigma Leadership Society. 
one thing that was really important to me as a student here was to make sure that we were reaching underserved communities. So that's one of the missions of SNAFA, and that's what led me to be uh, really active in that organization. I was really fortunate to have great women pharmacist mentors, particularly here. We had um, our advisors for SNAFA, but other pharmacists were definitely role models for me uh, as I was a student. But what led me to ambulatory care was my experience um, as a fourth year student. Uh, I actually had a rotation at the old Mile Square location, and it's interesting that I'm now at Mile Square so many years later. But I was introduced to diabetes education in pharmacy practice because my preceptor actually was studying to be a certified diabetes educator. And I had never heard of that uh, being an option for pharmacists. I didn't know that we could do that. So I was very interested. I have a family history of diabetes. So I was interested in providing uh, the best care to patients. That's when I got introduced to the older insulin pens, the durable pens, we now have disposable insulin pens, but I was able to start really educating patients about injection technique, showing them how to use a, a meter. So this was the first time that I was exposed to a pharmacist who had individual appointments with patients to provide not only medication administry, administration instruction, but general diabetes education. And I thought, you know what, I think that's something that I might wanna do in the future. Being at Mouse Square also made me more aware of social determinants of health. So Mouse Square is a federally qualified health center and I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about that. But the patients that we serve are the underserved. Patients who don't have the same access to care that someone else might have patients that are underinsured or uninsured. So one of the missions of Mouse Square is that we don't wanna deny care to anyone, uh, regardless of their ability to be able to pay for service. We are fortunate here at UIC that we have several pharmacies that provide 340B pricing. So that way we are able to provide medications at a discounted cost. So if someone were to take a prescription to retail pharmacy, they might be told, okay, this medication um, for a diabetes medication, some of the newer medications, it's $500 for a month supply. And a lot of patients are not gonna be able to afford that. So it's great that we have resources here that are able to assist patients that don't always have the ability to pay. I was also encouraged to pursue residency. So I worked as a pharmacy technician during pharmacy school, and I always wanted to consider what else could I do? What more could I do other than just calling the physician to ask for authorization to make a change? I like independence, so I was encouraged to pursue residency. And you might wonder, why should you consider residency or other postgraduate training? So it's not for everyone, but I wanted to learn as much as I could. And I felt that at the point of being a fourth year student, there was a lot more that I could learn. So this is an opportunity to continue your education as you begin your career as a pharmacist with guidance from preceptors. This also provides additional pharmacy practice and research opportunities. This also demonstrates and strengthens your ability to manage various responsibilities. So at the time that I did my residency, it was called a pharmacy practice residency. So that lets you know how long I've been out of school. It's now named a PGY1, so postgraduate year one. So my uh, residency was at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, which was a community hospital. It's now part of a larger health system. Um, in Southern Illinois, it's now located in Old Fallon, Illinois. Um, but I was the only pharmacy resident at the hospital and there were only three PharmDs in the hospital. So most of the pharmacists that I work with had bachelor degrees. And so interacting with other providers, particularly physicians, they're like, what is a PharmD? We're used to being in a wonderful pharmacy environment here at UIC where 
we're part of the team. Physicians value us being part of the team and they're used to us being here. So going to another um, type of environment was a definitely a challenging learning experience, but it's something I think I needed because I'm from Chicago, I went to school here, I wanted to explore and uh, I didn't apply for any residencies in Chicago. So I wanted to look at other options, but I ended up having a very positive learning experience. One thing um, that was different is that I was the only person of color in the pharmacy department. So that was a little challenging because there was limited diversity in the hospital, limited diversity in my um, pharmacy department, this was a smaller community. I'm from the big city. So we have a different population that we serve here at UIC. So um, I was exposed to unique rotations and opportunities. So one of which was home health. So I went to patients' homes in rural areas with a nurse practitioner. Uh, there were times where I wasn't sure if they were gonna let me in the house. You know, it, it was very interesting, but I didn't have any issues. People were receptive. Um, I think they were open once they knew that I had knowledge to provide um, for their care. I also was able to work with an uh, infectious disease physician in the hospital as well as his private practice. And I was given an opportunity to work at the VA in St. Louis for an oncology rotation. I felt like this is an was an area that I really didn't have a lot of experience with. I felt kind of apprehensive about learning about it, but I felt like, okay, this is something that I have to at least try. And I had to broaden my knowledge base. So that was definitely an experience that I was able to uh, benefit from. Now, even though I worked in retail, I felt that I needed experience in a hospital setting. And that's the reason why I decided to have a hospital-based um, residency uh, experience. So once I started working in the hospital, I felt like, okay, you know what? I really, really like AmCare. I really like the patient interaction and follow-up. So I decided to have my projects with ambulatory care focus. So I developed an outpatient infusion service. And again, overall, it was a very positive learning experience. So it's interesting that after my residency experience, I came back here and I was given a, an opportunity to be a clinical faculty and I've been here ever since. So when I initially started my uh, work as a pharmacist, I worked in the Wood Street Pharmacy. So we had to pretty much work full time in the pharmacy to get our experience. And then we were able to expand into clinical services. So. I was able to eventually, after one year, uh, spend one day a week in internal medicine, and then that expanded where I was um, spending half my time in internal medicine doing individual patient appointments and chronic disease state management and medication management. But I also reached out to an endocrinologist. So my goal was to obtain a thousand hours that are needed to become a certified diabetes educator. So now we're called certified diabetes care and education specialist. So I basically volunteered my non-clinic time, which we consider as project time. So time that we would be doing research, we would be doing um, teaching, things like that. But I felt that it was important for me to start getting these hours in order to get that credential. And it's interesting that I started with phone follow-up. So my experience with telehealth started many years ago. So when we had to go to um, all telehealth last year, it wasn't anything new. I've been doing telehealth and research as well. So, uh, and there are some patients who can benefit from that. So that's where I started. I was doing phone follow-up, uh, reviewing blood glucose readings, discussing um, treatment plans with the endocrinologist. And then I was given opportunities to have uh, patient appointments with the nurse practitioner. So I could see how patients with diabetes are examined, you know, how they check the feet, how they check the eyes, what things are done in a clinical visit. So that's something that um, we're not always able to have in detail. So working with a specialist, but this is something that I, actually had to pursue. So it wasn't like there was a 
uh, actual position that was available at that time, but this is something that I wanted. And after getting my credential, I was invited to join the team um, in the Nutrition and Wellness Center. So that's where our diabetes education program was located, is located. So um, that program is recognized by the American Diabetes Association, which is important in order to have reimbursement for the services that you provide. So I received my CDE um, in 2001, and I developed certain classes, understanding insulin and ask the pharmacist class, which is focusing on uh, oral medications. So I was able to do what's called diabetes evaluation individual appointments. So that was an hour period of time where we would assess patients' um, knowledge, any literacy uh, challenges, setting goals, uh, along with going through general diabetes principles. Um, I was also able to have consultations with the endocrinology team. Uh, during the time that I spent with endocrinology, I spent 10 years with half my time in uh, internal medicine and half my time with endocrinology. And then I was moved to, along with uh, another colleague of mine, we were moved to medication therapy management. So we were um, moved from our internal medicine practice to MTM. So uh, medication therapy management clinic is a pharmacist managed service within the outpatient care center pharmacy. And so we were having weekly to monthly appointments um, to improve adherence, as well as provide disease state management and education. So I was part of that clinical service for five years when I got an opportunity to go to Miles Square. So um, again, Miles Square is a federally qualified health center with multiple locations throughout Chicago. It's a multi multidisciplinary family medicine clinic with focus on providing care to the underserved. So there is a sliding uh, scale that's based on the ability for a patient to pay. There is a collaborative pharmacy practice. So there are protocols that have been developed to allow me to do chronic disease state management. So that includes diabetes education and management. So I see patients with diabetes every day because that's something that's a passion, that is um, the interest that I have, but I also uh, assist patients with other disease states. Um, my clinic site is also um, a site for pharmacy students and residents. So the process for me to see patients is that I receive referrals. So they were referring, either they'll say, refer to PharmD, refer to PharmD Diabetes Educator, refer to CDE. Um, sometimes they put my name directly in the medical record, refer to Daphne. So it's like I receive referrals from physicians and nurse practitioners who are the PCPs for our patients for disease state and medication management. So the protocols that we develop allow me to initiate, adjust, and discontinue medication. So there are times when we have to make medication changes with stopping medicines. Um, I'm able to order labs as well as provide point of care glucose and A1C measurements. So the appointments that I have with patients are 30 minutes, um, both in person and telehealth. So um, telehealth is something that I was doing through a study. Uh, it's been several years now. So we went to all telehealth and now I do a combination of both because there's some patients who definitely benefit from telehealth. I also accept uh, same day consultations. Um, the, one of the benefits is that I can have multiple interactions with patients independent of provider visits. So a patient might see a provider and they'll be referred to me and I can see them several times uh, in between uh, the time that they're going to have their next provider visit. There is now endocrinology consult service one day a week. So I was very excited when this uh, began because I wanted to stay connected with endocrinology. So these are um, endocrinologists that only come to Miles Square one day a week. Um, so they don't, we don't have all endocrinologists come. They're just uh, particular endocrinologists that provide the service. And we have plans to expand a continuous glucose monitoring system evaluations. 
So why is diabetes education and management important? Diabetes affects more than 34 million Americans, particularly in certain communities, such as African-American, Latino, Hispanic, Native American, and Asian communities. 88 million Americans have prediabetes, so we have a role here to educate patients on lifestyle changes and modifications so that we could delay uh, or prevent um, the progression to diabetes. In Illinois, there are 1.325 million persons that have diabetes with 3.393 million who have prediabetes. So pharmacists have an expanding role in providing diabetes education and management. There are more than 19,000 certified diabetes care and education specialists in the United States. About 770 of those are here in Illinois as of April of this year. Only 8% in the country of the um, diabetes education specialists are pharmacists. So this is an area where there are opportunities for pharmacists to provide more diabetes education. Reimbursement of diabetes education is available as part of a recognized diabetes education program. Pharmacists also have the ability to help identify and address health disparities. So this is something that I'm very passionate about. I feel that all patients deserve good care. Unfortunately, there are patients that have barriers to receiving the appropriate care. So social determinants of health are conditions in the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risk. Food insecurity, financial challenges, and unsafe environments impact diabetes management. I have patients that say, I don't feel comfortable or I don't think it's safe for me to walk in my neighborhood for exercise. Um, they might have a very small residence, so they're not able to have a lot of space to do certain activity. So these are real challenges. Access to care barriers, including health literacy and technology challenges, have been magnified during the COVID-19 pandemic. My current clinical practice addresses disparities and promotes well-being. So I'm not just concerned about um, their diabetes. I'm concerned about patients as a whole. So you as future pharmacists, it's important to partner with other healthcare professionals to help provide solutions for these type of issues. So you wanna get involved in community projects. So one of the ways that I maintain my involvement uh, in the community is I've been an active part of the American Diabetes Association's local committees. I first started years ago with a program called Project Power that was initially developed to increase diabetes awareness in the African American church community. So I was a speaker for the program as well as a workshop facilitator. The focus of the program now is for children and it's virtual. I've also been a part of the American Diabetes Association Chicago Expo um, for diabetes uh, for several years. So we haven't had it, of course, uh, due to the, to the pandemic, but I was part of the Ask the Expert section, as well as helping to coordinate uh, blood glucose monitoring by students, pharmacy students, with faculty preceptor assistance. Currently, I'm a member of the Wellness Committee. Uh, we just had Tour de Cure. Um, last Sunday, um, and I've been able to be a part of this committee for a few years, um, as well as create diabetes education videos, which are showcased um, virtually, so on their Facebook page and on their um, Diabetes Illinois page. One thing that I think is important is to continue health promotion. So this is done through health fairs and as well as partnerships with different organizations. So part of my role here um, is to provide education for you in core and elective courses. I'm also a preceptor um, for IPPE and APPE students as well as pharmacy residents. And uh, in 2008, I co-developed a diabetes elective course which includes a diabetes experience assignment. I felt that it was important that 
um, pharmacy students be able to understand some of the day-to-day -day challenges persons with diabetes experience and to be able to be sensitive and empathetic um, and to kind of change the mind, um, the thoughts that we have about how diabetes should be managed. So um, my students are currently going through the process right now. Some of them might be on um, the Zoom call, but they're a person with diabetes for 10 days. So they're um, instructed to do a nutrition and blood glucose log, um, take placebo metformin, and they have saline injection as their insulin. So the students have to journal their activities and then next week, they're gonna be sharing their experience in class. Um, I was previously a co-advisor for SNAP of more than 10 years, and I'm also a FLAMES advisor. I wanted to just share with you some of the diabetes research um, that I've been involved with. You might be familiar that there are several studies that have demonstrated the benefit of pharmacists in diabetes management, particularly in ambulatory care or community pharmacy sites. So I was involved in a pilot study in the internal medicine clinic um, with a health promoter. And so we had um, visits where the health promoter was uh, a part of our visit and we looked at the A1C improvement after six months. And that was shown, just our interaction um, was shown to decrease or improve the A1C by 0.6%. Um, this led us to a larger study, so a pharmacist and health promoter study to evaluate effectiveness of that team to improve diabetes behavior and medication adherence. So not as much A1C reduction, about 0.45% in that particular study, but currently we're doing a mobile health study with a pharmacist and health promoter to evaluate clinical outcomes in African-American and Hispanic patients. Um, I was able to have students work with me and we evaluated 200 patients who have seen me um, either once, twice, or three or more times. And we saw that um, there was an average A1C reduction of 1% in patients who had two or more visits with me. So this is something that we presented at the, um, it was called American Association of Diabetes Educators, but now because of our name change is the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists. So that was a great opportunity for my students. I've also been involved with other collaborations uh, with UIC faculty. So we've been able to publish um, our research. Diabetes has opened the doors, not only for me uh, here in Chicago, uh, but internationally. Um, I'm currently affiliate associate professor at the University of Malta. I'll be teaching those students in actually two weeks. Um, so I'm providing remote teaching for diabetes. Um, I also had the great opportunity in 2017 to develop workshops, continuing education uh, presentations for um, a weekend program. So it was called Fight Against Diabetes. And this was in Singapore. So this was at the Singapore General Hospital. So that was awesome. I'm so glad that that occurred before the pandemic, um, but I was really fortunate to be able to interact with pharmacists and see what challenges they have had um, in their pharmacy practice in relation to providing diabetes education and care. So what are the rewards of diabetes management? So, Definitely the thing that I love um, about AM care and diabetes management is that I develop a long-term patient relationship. So that's one of the things that I felt when I worked in inpatient um, didn't work well for me. I really wanted to see what happens to the patient after we make changes, what are long-term um, progress that we can see. So this allows me, working with diabetes patients, allows me to observe the impact of clinical interventions. Also, I'm considered a valued member of multidisciplinary team, and I think as pharmacists, particularly here, we are valued and we want to make sure that is something that is um, continued in other health settings. 
I like the independence. I like the ability to make changes, to have the protocols where I don't have to ask the physician every time I want to make a change. I'm able to do the change and see the impact of that change. And also what's rewarding is to collaborate with other healthcare professionals. So through research and also just other publications. So we recently had a publication and key posted for the Illinois Council of Health System Pharmacists, just working with other uh, pharmacists um, within Mile Square, uh, looking at um, certain therapies. So there's always opportunities for collaboration. So what are the challenges? There is limited reimbursement for service depending on a, the practice setting. So I work in a federally qualified health center. I cannot directly bill for the services that I provide because there's a standard fee for um, patient services. So I'm considered to be part of the provider um, care. So patients can see me several times, but they're not gonna be you know, getting a bill for my services. But that's also something to consider because as part of the ADA recognized program, providing diabetes education, I was able to bill as a certified diabetes educator. So my goal is to connect Miles Square with our ADA recognized program so that we can be an extension of the services that I've been a part of for several years. Another challenge is improved clinical outcomes. I can see improvements in A1C, but does this actually show up as significant financial benefits for the clinic or for the health system? Also, pharmacist provider status. So if we're not considered as providers who can actually see patients independently or not necessarily completely see patients independently, but we can make certain uh, clinical um, changes, that limits us as far as uh, what we're able to do in certain instances. Also balancing clinic time with faculty responsibilities. I do have a lot of teaching responsibilities and I do see a lot of patients in clinic and oftentimes I'm getting epic messages. Uh, I'm getting emails about even text messages sometimes about, um, I sent you a note, I want you to follow up with, with someone. So I definitely have um, providers reaching out to me often to assist their patients. Um, and health disparities continue to exist. So um, this is something that's an ongoing challenge, it's something that we have to do better with, um, but that's something that does impact diabetes management. Oftentimes there are patients that I see certain time of the month, they say that they have limited um, food benefits. So they get a link card, so they have a certain amount of money that is allowed it, allotted for uh, food. And oftentimes it's not much, oftentimes they run out um, not long after the month starts. And so later on in the month, you might see patients' blood sugars increase because they're eating more starchy carbohydrates. They don't have much leafy vegetables at home. So we have to think about how can we be sensitive? How can we manage the diabetes um, still with the, the resources that we're able to, to provide? So what are diabetes management opportunities that I'm excited about? So um, a clinical pharmacist group of us, of ours here, um, have been discussing a continuous glucose monitoring service. So that's something I hope will be happening soon in the future. Uh, but one of the challenges is billing. How do we have um, reimbursement to the clinic or provide some financial benefit for the services that we are providing. And then also expanding consultations and research within um, my practice setting. So I have some upcoming research that will be beginning. I wanted to share with you a recent diabetes success story. So not often do you get emails from your patients thanking you for what you do, but I was really touched by the fact that the patient took the time to do that. Um, I'm not expecting that from any of my patients, but I definitely wanted to share this with you. Um, I definitely uh, also shared it with um, my clinic and department. So the patient wrote to me and said, I wanted to personally say thank you for your help, guidance, and attention during my di diabetic journey. I was crazy happy to hear that my A1C is now 6.2. You said I should get good news, and I did. 
So I had talked to her about with the improvements that we were seeing, I really thought that her A1C would be significantly improved. The patient said, I learned so much from you and uh, Haley. So um, that was the resident that was working with me and she was able to see the patient for three weeks during the time of her rotation. The patient said, I hope that all of your patients have as much gratitude as I do. So this patient was recently diagnosed in May and um, the A1C was 16%. So that means that her blood sugars were significantly um, high. So we saw that her A1C went from 16 to 6.2% in three months. That's something that you don't see. Um, you know, we have to be careful about reducing A1Cs too quickly or too significantly, but weekly telehealth visits with the patient were really vital in having this occur. I addressed nutrition in great detail. Um, I addressed her emotional and behavioral health. Oftentimes, patients get a diagnosis of diabetes and it's overwhelming. They can be in, den in denial, they can be angry, they can have a lot of emotions, and we don't want to ignore that. We went through her blood glucose uh, readings very closely, and then medication management, of course, was part of the reason why her A1C improved. So I actually reduced her insulin doses. Um, kind of not long after I started working with her because I was seeing different things occur. Um, and so I actually reduced, started reducing her insulin and making some other changes. One thing that I did as well is I informed the patient that this was a partnership with me to improve her overall health. So I wasn't just concerned with her diabetes. That was part of what I was going to do to uh, assist her. But I wanted to make sure that I was letting her know I was concerned with her as a person. So I want to leave you with some pearls of wisdom. So I have a few slides um, because I wanna encourage you, um, not only just with uh, considering diabetes management, but as you continue in your pharmacy career. I would suggest that you start with a self-assessment. So determine what your interests are, which may change during pharmacy school. So depending on where you are uh, in your stage, uh, of pharmacy education, you might think, oh yeah, I really want to go into this particular area of pharmacy, but you just never know. You might have an experience as um, a P2, an IPPE experience, or as a P4. You might have a rotation that really, really impacts you in a positive way. Evaluate your strengths and areas for improvement and develop plans to expand knowledge. Be proactive. One thing that when I worked in, in retail as a student, um, my pharmacy manager would always say, you don't think like a student, you think like a pharmacist. I'm always thinking like, okay, what can we do to prevent a problem? What can we do? Like, what are things that we need to get done? Like I was always thinking ahead. You also want to be prepared for whatever opportunities come your way. You want to be flexible. Um, I didn't know what changes were going to occur in my pharmacy career as far as changes in clinic settings. Um, but once the opportunity uh, presented itself from Mouse Square, I jumped at the opportunity and applied for the position. So you just never know what could uh, possibly be out there for you. You may need to create a career path with guidance, of course. So I had to go for how can I get these hours? I had to use some of my non-clinic time. Not everybody's gonna do that, but that was something that I felt that I needed to do. Um, so you might need to create a path for what you really are passionate about. Um, be able to receive and value constructive feedback. Um, sometimes it's difficult to do that, but um, oftentimes, you know, your preceptors, faculty are trying to help you become the best pharmacist that you can be. Be resilient learn from challenges. We all have challenges. We all are disappointed in some aspects of our career, but you want to learn from those challenges and, and think, what can I do better? What can I do um, to improve? Um, so kind of learn from those challenges. Develop professional relationships with pharmacists. So flames is one way that we have our family. Um, also mentors and also being part of pharmacy organizations and several of you might have already done so, but be open to accept leadership positions. 
you want to com uh, provide community service, not only within your requirements, but outside of what you're told that you need to do. So consider how you can give back to the community. Consider certification in a professional interest area. Work-life balance is important, but it's difficult to maintain. So spiritual mental health is important. So kind of think about healthy ways to manage stress. Also, everyone needs a support system. So whether it's your family or your friends, you need someone that you can be able to depend on or just express how you're feeling. And remember, pharmacy practice is a continuous learning profession. So in summary about diabetes management, it's very rewarding yet demanding. But it's something that I think is um, really an opportunity for pharmacists because we can provide and observe the long-term impact of clinical interventions. We're also able to provide opportunities uh, for us to work within clinical practice in an independent manner, which is great. Um, this also allows an atmosphere for development of professional relationships with patients and trainees, and also provides additional opportunities to collaborate with healthcare professionals. So I want to just thank again the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, thank all of the student organization co-sponsors, and happy Women Pharmacists Day. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith Marsh, for that great presentation on being a woman in pharmacy and your journey throughout the last, uh, you know, twenty some years in pharmacy. It's been very insightful and inspiring to me, and I'm sure everyone else on the call. I will be starting the Q and A session. If students have any questions, feel free to unmute your mic right now or throw it in the chat, and I will read it aloud for everyone. And I suppose I can just start off with my first question. Um, Sure. You have had such a long career um, and successful career ever since you've obtained your PharmD. What continues to motivate you to continue to push the profession of pharmacy forward and to continue innovation in pharmacy? Um, I think my joy for working with patients. I love working with patients. And one of the things um, one of my patients mentioned to me is that I can tell you care. Um, she mentioned how another person had a not so positive experience with an endocrinologist at another institution. And she felt that um, we cared. We cared about her. We cared about uh, what was going on in her life. So the thing that I always try to express to my students is that um, we should be promoting wellness. So not always just what medications we should give to a patient. That's part of the process, but we need to also consider non-pharmacologic methods and also consider uh, behavioral health and wellness. So that's something that I think, you know, we need to continue to expand upon as pharmacists and we're doing that. But I think that's uh, definitely part of our education that we provide to our students that we always want to consider uh, the patient as a whole. Great, thank you so much. And yeah, going alongside with trying to instill the empathy and caring in our pharmacy students, uh, just to provide the best patient care, what other changes can we as pharmacy students right now make to feel more fulfilled in our career and kind of prevent a burnout and continue our passion for pharmacy like you have? Um, I think that balance you need, to, you know, because sometimes you're always in the mode and I understand, I remember what it's like to be a student, even though it's been a long time, but there's a lot that you're managing, you know, working, you know, class uh, responsibilities, uh, family responsibilities, try to find something that you also enjoy to do, whether it's a hobby, whether it's something with um, your family, but kind of remember why you went into pharmacy. Sometimes I think um, students might forget. You know, some people go into pharmacy for different reasons and it gets challenging and they think, okay, um, why did I do this? Or it's, it's really hard right now. So kind of just think about what you really want to do as far as healthcare is concerned. How do you want to impact patients in a positive way? So kind of think about what really drew you to pharmacy, but also be open because there are so many opportunities in pharmacy. So you don't wanna feel like you're limiting yourself. So be open to um, some great opportunities that might be out there for you. 
That's great words of wisdom. Again, it just helps to, I think, continue to motivate us even, you know, when tests may get hard or coursework may get hard to focus on the vision, which is great. Um, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to drop it in the chat. Uh, I have questions for days, I know, so I can keep going <laughs> along with my next one was the success story. I'm just curious if you could elaborate with the weekly telehealth visits. Yes. Um, since that isn't, I know, a common attribute with telehealth, while telehealth is beneficial for you know, having more frequent visits in between doctor's appointments. Uh, what were you doing at each telehealth visit? Was it a medication change every single time? Or was no. it more just to discuss with the patient and keep them motivated to pursue their health? Well, that's always part of it, but I have certain goals that I wanna achieve at a visit. So this is a person who's newly diagnosed with diabetes. So it's overwhelming to go through everything they need to know at one visit. Um, oftentimes, um, my appointments are 30 minute appointments, but oftentimes patients really need an hour with me if they are newly diagnosed with diabetes. So whether I'm doing insulin education, you know, sometimes even doing meter instruction um, for a person who's just newly diagnosed, they're overwhelmed with uh, information. So because the patient's blood sugar average was so high, we wanted to really start tackling certain things. So small steps to change. So, okay, this week, this is what we're gonna work on. Maybe these are some changes that you can make in your nutrition. Okay, let's have you start checking your blood sugar. You know, so there are certain goals that we had each week. So no, it wasn't always necessarily adjusting every week. I did have to adjust quite a bit, um, but I saw her six weeks straight. So there were adjustments within that period, but sometimes it was just going over her nutrition and blood sugar readings and encouragement. Um, so it just kind of depends on what the needs are. Sometimes patients are referred to uh, a diabetes educator or a dietitian, and they might see them once or twice and then they don't follow up and they don't come back and see their provider for a month or two or maybe three. So um, if we don't catch or help the patient within that time period, oftentimes um, things don't get better, they might get worse. So um, I see a question in the chat. Um, oh, thank you, Rachel. <laughs> I see what questions. Um, so there was a question, let me scroll back up. Uh, how much time do we spend with patients? So I have 30 minute appointments. Um, but like I was just mentioning with the patient who was newly diagnosed, um, it's hard to go through everything in 30 minutes. You just can't. Um, so there are times if I have time to do an hour visit, I will. But usually I have back to back appointments. And then also I have same day requests for consultation. So patient might be seeing a provider and they're like, hey, in room, whatever. I have someone who needs to be you know, taught how to use an insulin pen or taught a meter, or they're gonna be starting in a GLP-1 and they need to know how to use the medication or there could be um, requests on the spot for assistance. So, um, you know, whatever I can do to try to accommodate those patients, but 30 minutes is the time period that I have for scheduled appointments. Thank you so much for answering Roxanne's question. And does anyone else have any other questions they would like to ask at this time? Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Tara, for leading the Q&A. And thank you, um, Dr. Marsh, woman, um, Smith Marsh, um, so much for you know, presenting today. And I'm just so happy that we were able to invite you for today's on Women's Pharmacist Day. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.